Hello, it's Scott Manley here. When mainstream news talk about spaceflight, you'll, they'll sometimes try to communicate the huge speeds involved by having a narrator explain that the space station is moving through space at a speed of about 25 times the speed of sound. And inevitably, when this happens, there's some nerd that will say, well, actually, there's no sound in space. Because, of course, this is just a way of trying to teach people about big numbers, right? What they're really stating is the space station's orbital velocity is about 25 times the speed of sound at measured at ambient temperature and pressure at sea level, right? But that's too complicated, so it just gets cut down to the speed of sound. Anyway, I'm sure that many of you out there understand that the vacuum is famously silent. And some people go out of their way to complain about movies and TV shows showing space battles with sound effects punctuating the action. To paraphrase Alien, in space, nobody can hear you scream about how inaccurate sound in space is. Except the near vacuum of space can in fact carry sound waves, just not sound waves that we humans can hear. Sound waves are pressure waves in a medium, and a, in a perfect vacuum, there's no pressure, so no pressure waves, right? But the vacuum of space isn't actually a perfect vacuum. There's atoms floating around and occasionally bumping into each other. And while the density of vacuum is way lower than the atmosphere we're used to, it's still an atmosphere according to the laws of physics, so it can in fact sustain pressure and by extension, it can sustain pressure waves or sound. So physics tells us that the vacuum can in fact carry sound waves and we can figure out the speed of sound in a vacuum. The speed of sound in an ideal gas to a first approximation depends upon the temperature and the composition of the gas. That's all, right? Which means that as we go up through the atmosphere of Earth, the change in the speed of sound is primarily driven by the change in the temperature and not the change in the pressure. So specifically for the speed of sound, the velocity is proportional to the square root of the temperature divided by the molecular mass. And there, then there's some constants for the, like the Boltzmann constant and the adiabatic index. But you know, the basic equation is pretty simple. So we can apply this to near Earth orbit where the International Space Station is. Inside the thermosphere, it's mainly monoatomic oxygen and nitrogen. Therefore, these particles are half the mass at sea level. And uh, the temperature is maybe you know, 2000 Celsius. So if you just put these numbers in and take the square root, the speed of sound at the altitude of the International Space Station is about four times the speed of sound at the surface of the Earth. There is also a factor called the adiabatic index, which is relevant because it defines how much energy goes into particle motion versus internal rotation and vibration in molecules. But monoatomic gases don't have these internal modes, so they're actually about 10% faster over the diatomic versions just due to this factor. So anyway, the International Space Station actually moves at about six times the speed of sound at the altitude it's at. Not that we would be able to hear it make a sonic boom. Now you've probably seen a classic science experiment where you put an old-fashioned alarm clock into a vacuum chamber and have it ringing, and then you observe that as you reduce the pressure in the chamber, the sound starts to fade out. And now that we know that the speed of sound isn't changing much, it's actually the ability of the alarm clock bells to transmit, you know, into that pressure wave, in, into that medium, and then for that pressure wave to hit the wall and transmit out so that we outside can hear it, right? Now, since the energy in a wave is proportional to the square of the amplitude, then naturally the sound energy carried away by the gas is proportional to the square of the density. So to a first approximation, cutting the air pressure by a factor of 10 reduces your sound volume by a factor of 100, or 20 decibels. That's the main reason why we wouldn't hear sound in space, because the couple inefficiency of coupling the audio source to the medium. A fine example of this attenuation is ingenuity on Mars, right? You know, there's a microphone on Perseverance, and although the surface of Mars isn't a vacuum, it is effectively a vacuum to our frail human bodies. It's like 1% of the atmospheric pressure. And the sound that we get out of this is very, very quiet, needs to be amplified a lot. 
Another recent example which I love showing sound in the vacuum of space is the stage separation video from Rocket Lab's Electron, right? We can actually hear the sound of the second stage engine igniting and firing because of course there's pressure in those gases coming back at us and that is how the sound is being communicated across space and of course it fades out very very quickly because as it travels away the gas pressure drops off very rapidly. Anyway, Look, it's not just the volume that gets affected as the air gets more and more tenuous. The highest frequency sound that the atmosphere can support actually drops as the air pressure gets lower, as the air density goes down. You see, sound is pressure waves, and pressure waves are a macroscopic phenomenon where we imagine the gas as a sort of continuous medium. But that's just a sort of mathematical representation. If you zoom in on the gas, it's actually made of individual atoms or molecules bouncing around and hitting each other. And the scale at which a collection of particles bouncing around begins to transition into something that you can model as a fluid is a function of what's called the mean free path, i.e. how far a particle can move before it inevitably bounce, bounce, bumps into another one. So a fluid can't support pressure waves of the wavelength that is shorter than the mean free path. But even then, it's not great at it. It's not like a hard cutoff in frequency. The, like the higher frequency you go, the less in, or the, the less good the gas gets at communicating or transmitting that energy, and it drops to zero effectively when it hits this mean free path wavelength. So as you go up in the atmosphere and the pressure drops, the higher frequencies get attenuated to lower and lower levels. And once you reach 160 kilometers up, you enter a region of the Earth's atmosphere called the anacoustic zone. In this region, the highest frequency that can be supported by the thin atmosphere is below the lowest frequency that can be heard by a human. Of course, this is entirely academic since the air is too thin to support humans for long enough for them to care about the soundtrack. But sound can still propagate, just at very low frequency, very low energy. And physics tells us that even in the hard interstellar vacuum of deep space, the tenuous gas can support sound waves at low enough frequencies. How low? Well, we've seen some phenomena with telescopes where there are evidence for pressure waves with, you know, very, very extraordinarily low frequencies. So one case, there is a black, supermassive black hole at the center of the Perseus cluster, and astronomers have seen concentric shells of pressure waves, presumably emanating outwards from it, driven by relativistic jets interacting, uh, you know, in the center, creating loud pressure waves. And these pressure waves have cycle times of about 10 million years. That's 30 femtohertz, or as one scientist put it, it's about 57 octaves below middle C. Dubstep has got nothing on black holes. We see other pressure phenomena in deep space, like bow shocks as stars move rapidly through gas clouds and create spectacular nebula. Zeta Ophiuchi is a nearby example of this. And there's the Guitar Nebula, where there's a neutron star zipping through the galaxy at 800 kilometers per second. It's going faster than the escape velocity from the Milky Way, and doing this, it's leaving a high pressure shock wave behind it. This neutron star was probably in the middle of a supermassive star that began a you know, core collapse supernova, and it was asymmetric enough to kick off this neutron star at these ridiculous speeds. Now, I should also be clear that when I'm talking about nebula in deep space, there are also cases where you have ionized plasmas, and those can support waves, plasma waves, because the electromagnetic fields interact with the ions and effectively, you know, allow the ions to look bigger and reduce the mean free path to something much shorter. So, yes, you can actually have plasmas carrying waves, and they could carry waves at higher frequencies than a simple pressure wave, they're not technically sound waves, although technically you could carry sound over them if you wanted. And then, in the early universe, before it had expanded and cooled to what it is today, before the you know, emission of the microwave background radiation, the pressures and temperatures were higher, and there were pressure waves moving through the universe. These waves are sort of some of the earliest structures in the universe, and we can see this on the cosmic microwave background radiation. And as the universe cooled, these high-density pressure peaks 
would actually begin to collapse under their own gravity to form the earliest structures in the universe, clusters and whatever of gravity. So yes, there is sound in space. You just can't hear it. But your very existence and that of the Earth, the Sun and the Milky Way originated in what was effectively a sound wave in the early universe. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.